Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno, proud to help introduce a new generation of adventurers to the diverse experiences that our state has to offer. Information at lrlv.com or jlrreno.com. Nevada, a landscape as diverse as it is epic. Where wide open nature and wild adventure call to the curious and the brave alike. I understand you have bull riding here. Oh, we do have bull riding. All right, I'm gonna try it. I'm in for the ride of my life at Sandy Valley Ranch on the Nevada-California border. How many petroglyphs are there throughout the state? Well, thousands, thousands of petroglyph sites, most of which have not been recorded yet. I'm discovering ancient art in the Valley of Fire State Park. And you know what else I like about Lake Tahoe? The people here, are, are they're great. It, yeah, very easy going people. Easy going people. We call it Tahoe time. I'm sport fishing on one of the world's most beautiful bodies of water, Lake Tahoe. So tell me about this recipe. It, it's, it goes back a long ways. It does. Um, near as we can tell, it's been traced back about 140 years from the original start. And the Dutch Diva takes me back 140 years with the Bell's family sourdough recipe. I'm John Byrne. I have a passion for the outdoors. Today we're in the Valley of Fire. And I'm on a mission to show you the one of a kind history, science, nature, and adventure you find when you step outside. This is Outdoor Nevada. The culture of cowboys and cowgirls is deeply rooted in Nevada. Here at Sandy Valley Ranch, folks are celebrating this culture every day. You ready for an Old West adventure? Nevada is a state with lots to see and do. There's fly fishing, duck hunting, four wheeling, but if you want a full on cowboy experience, you have to come here to the Sandy Valley Ranch, where their motto is, it's 45 minutes and 100 years outside of Las Vegas. Let's go meet the boss lady. Located on the California and Nevada border, the ranch is dedicated to raising cattle, training horses, rodeoing, and preserving American and Hispanic riding styles. So this is Marilyn Gubler. She is otherwise known in these parts as the boss lady. Nice seeing you. How are you? Very nice to see you, John. Am I in heaven or is this Nevada? Yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about this place, how it came into being. Well, about 15 years ago, I came out here, and the minute I came over the mountain, I was in love. I love the valley. I love how it looks as you come over. It reminded me of my childhood in Las Vegas. So I bought some acreage, and then I decided maybe there was a, a business here. And I did a little research, and lo and behold, it turned out people who want to live the life of the West. They love the glitz and glamour of Las Vegas, but they just love to get away and play cowboy for real. Who hasn't dreamed of that? Well, we just got here and I get it. I already get what you're you talking about, but it. I want to go take a closer look. Let's go. Okay. Sandy Valley Ranch is a family affair dating back to the 1930s. Meet Marilyn's daughter, Laura. All right, Laura, so what do we got here? This is our bucking barrel. Your bucking barrel. Our bucking barrel, yes. He's right. not quite alive. We're preparing you for a, a little bit later. Right. So go ahead, mount up. If you, you put your left okay. leg right. in the stirrup, there you go. Does this thing have so a name? Over. You know, it doesn't have a name. All right, so what are we doing? Let's put this in your left hand, yeah. Right. We're gonna wrap it around nice and tight like a real bull rider. All right, All right you're good. This arm up, please, okay. All right. for balance. Grip with your legs. Okay. When the, when the steer comes forward, you're gonna head back and right. vice versa. And, and and how long do I need to be on this? Eight seconds would be amazing. Eight seconds, come on, eight seconds. You got this. That's start, nothing. Start eight counting now. Eight seconds. All right. And we're ready. On your mark. Okay. Go! Woo! <laughs> What's that? Five, six, seven, eight! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Did it! Woo -hoo -hoo! I think I get the transmission fixed on this thing. The ranch is a one-of-a-kind place where you can see real buckaroos and vaqueros riding bulls and horses just like back in the day. 
Vaqueros are Spanish-influenced, highly skilled cowboys. They have centuries of riding and wrangling experience. How much do you know about the rodeo and, and, and riding bulls and all that kind of stuff? You know, I'm around it. I've been around it since I was a wee child, um, so I know a bit. Yeah. I don't get myself on a bull, though. I, I know enough to, say, to stay off of it, <laughs> but I can certainly dress a goat. Dress a goat? Is that the <laughs> yeah. next thing? That's the next thing. Why would you not dress a goat? <laughs> Sounds like a bad party I went to one time. All right, so let's go try it out, okay? Let's do it. I'm just going with the flow here, and in this case, the flow means decking out this goat. Let's do it. Shall, do you want to do bottoms or tops? I'll do the bottoms. <laughs> Both legs in, See. please. Both legs in? Both legs in. I'm dressing a goat. Sorry about that. Sorry, I know. If you've ever gotten a four-year-old ready for school. <laughs> this is actually even tougher. This is, yeah. It's, uh, actually, it's, it's easier. Okay, okay uh, good. I know, not, not your cover. Okay, here we go. Oh, almost there. <laughs> All right, bud. Here we go. Top time. He kind of likes it. You has do. he done this? Has this goat done this before? This goat has done this before. Oh, all right. Oh, thank you. Look at that. I'd be Beautiful running back foot. to my friends. Hey, look what I got. Oh, and how gorgeous. Oh, look at that. Look Just at that. Sure, we tuck it in. <laughs> so handsome. <laughs> I'll get you an outdoor Nevada hat. Now that I've tackled a bucking barrel and dressed a goat, I'm ready to move on to riding a real horse. Okay, so now what are we doing? We're gonna go cattle penning. Okay. In the arena, so we'll hop on horses. We'll, thanks Chloe, I love that. <laughs> nice hug. Um, friendly horses we have here. We're gonna pick out some cattle, herd them into an arena, and have some fun with it. That sounds like fun. Now who is this? This is Splash. Splash. Yes, he's You know a good what I've boy. noticed about the ranch here is you take really good care mm. of these animals, yeah? Thank you for saying that. They're family, and they're our livelihood, and, right? So yeah. yeah, we do take good care of them. Even the goats get clothing. I mean, everybody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should we go? Please. All right. Go ahead. Once I'm saddled up on Splash, we head over to the pen area. And the point of this is we're going to herd together all of these cows and put them in the pen. At that point, if we needed to, we could give them shots, we could brand them. So kind of with all rodeo type activities, it's all based in actual work and actual history. So do each one of us have a different responsibility? Yes, well, you know, someone will push the cattle, others will kind of be on their sides, keeping them into a nice little herd. As you'll see, if we, if we got them worked up, they love to kind of scatter. Um, but they're also, you know, they're herd animals. So if we can keep them in a nice tight knit form, we look like pros. Let's go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Who? Oh yeah. That's it. Who? Penning was a lot of fun, but now I'm ready to move on to something really challenging. I understand you have bull riding here. Oh, we do have bull riding. All right, I'm gonna try it. Well, I admire your courage, but I'm not too sure about your judgment. Who? <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm walking like a cowboy. Here's Sandy Valley Ranch. You get to do things you would never do. And that ain't no bull. My Old West adventure has been beyond awesome. But now, sadly, it's time to say my goodbyes and ride off into the sunset. Well, I just wanted to say thanks for having us out at the Sandy Valley Ranch because this place is, it's fantastic. Well, we had an absolutely wonderful time sharing our little piece of heaven with you. Thank you so much for appreciating us. Come back. I'll be here. Well, I showed up as a TV host. I'm moseying on as a cowboy. So today we're in the Valley of Fire, and the reason that we're here is because if you want to see petroglyphs that are really ancient, this is the place in Nevada to go. Just 50 miles from the bright lights of the Las Vegas Strip lies the Valley of Fire State Park, a place where the rocks are the stars. Hey, John. Hey, Kevin. Nice seeing you. Nice seeing you, sir. How are you doing? Good. Beautiful Nevada morning, isn't it? Absolutely gorgeous. Can't beat it in Valley of Fire. Kevin Rafferty from the College of Southern Nevada has devoted the past 12 years of his life to researching the petroglyphs of the Valley of Fire. Just standing in front of them, it's, it's breathtaking. You could do this all day. And I have. 
<laughs> I have literally done that. I like coming out here about 6, 6.30 in the morning when my students are not around and sitting with a cup of coffee and just staring at the, I've literally stared at petroglyph sites I found for a couple of hours, just kind of going, yeah. This is making my head hurt because I'm trying to figure out what they're saying. And you really can't. You can make logical, educated guesses based on context, based on ethnography, you know, from historically known peoples. Mm -hmm. But at best, it's an educated guess. Since the people who made the petroglyphs, the Anasazi, abandoned the valley over 700 years ago, many questions remain. So first of all, Kevin, how old are these? They're probably 1,000 to 1,500 years old. They probably date from about 700 AD to about 1300 AD. So they're 1,011, 12, 1,300 years old. You just throw out those numbers, but that's cool. It is very cool. Of course, 1,300 years ago, there wasn't a convenient metal staircase to the rock face. We are high up here, I, we, 60, 80 feet up here, right? Is it, yeah, I would say roughly 60, 70 feet, yeah. All right, so my first question for you is, I'm looking at these petroglyphs, how do they draw these things up here? Well, here you can see they have some ledges. They could reach part of the area. And they probably used, best guess, is very short ladders. A lot of the people who lived in this area lived in pit houses, you know, the Anasazi, and they needed ladders to get down into the pit houses. So they probably just translated that technology here. And how did they do it? They just take a rock? Yes, probably a, a pestle or a pestle-shaped rock. And they would carve or chip away, um, peck away at the rock to create these designs. It's amazing to think that these guys made better artwork with a rock than I can make using a pen. But I'm looking at this foot and it's so perfect. How long would that take? In the hands of an expert, an hour, hour yeah. and a half probably. Less expert, a couple hours. And for someone who's an amateur, long time. There's a reason why the ancient artists chose this place for their work. These magnificent walls of red rock are perfect for petroglyphs. So, I look out at this beautiful landscape, it's so vast, right. why here? Well, there's a couple of reasons. For one thing, we have this dark patina over the, uh, the sandstones called desert varnish. It serves as kind of a canvas. You notice that when you peck away the patina, it sticks out. It, this is designed to be seen. You can see it from down there. You can see it from a little bit of a distance. So there's a message they're trying to convey. I don't want to say it's like a billboard, but it's kind of like in the neighborhood. So this particular rock in this valley was something that everybody could see or read, and so they were trying, this is almost like their media center. To a certain degree, yeah, that makes sense. But made of wind-blown clay and high concentrations of manganese, desert varnish is highly vulnerable to erosion. How are these all here with all the elements that take place out here in the desert? Well, the good thing is we don't get a lot of rain. Okay, so rain is one of the major erosional factors out here. And when you only get four, four and a half, five inches of rain a year, it kind of preserves them for a long period of time. But I think eventually, within a thousand years or so, these will probably be gone. So the petroglyphs are a thousand years old with a thousand years left to go. It's a midlife crisis. How do you preserve these? Well, we don't do any actual physical preservation. You don't spray it with any kind of lacquer or anything like that, because it takes away from the natural setting. And then we record them when we find them. So we have an archive. So when they eventually disappear, which they will, um, we can give that legacy to future generations. One thing that's already been lost is the meaning of the glyphs. I can pick out certain things. I can pick out a foot right. or maybe a, a ladder or a sheep. Can you read this? What were they trying to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> wow. If anybody who says they really know what the petroglyphs are saying is just fooling themselves, a lot of it, it's not a language like we're used to, okay? It's not, it doesn't have a grammar, it doesn't have punctuation, it doesn't have a sentence structure. Um, it's telling a story. It's communicating somehow, but a lot of it depends on context. That's got to be frustrating. It is for me. It's got to be frustrating for you that we're not quite sure what they're saying. Can you give us a clue as to what you think? Obviously, you have your basic bighorn sheep. And the problem with having bighorn sheep is some of the earliest interpretations where it's all hunting magic. How many petroglyphs are there throughout the state? Well, thousands. Thousands of petroglyph sites, most of which have not been recorded yet. Hmm. In this valley alone, I've probably recorded 50 or 60 of them that hadn't been discovered before I was working out here. So there's thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of sites like this in the Nevada region alone. Can we go look at some more? Absolutely. Let's Love go, to. man. 
The Valley of Fire may have thousands of undiscovered spots, but there's almost no way to miss this next one. It just seems to me that they wanted this one to be seen, almost like a, like a billboard for everyone. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it really sticks out. It is designed to be seen. You can see there's a whole series of bighorn sheep motifs on this one. This was probably related to some kind of either right of increase to increase the supply of bighorn sheep, or as some people have suggested, hunting magic. It really brings you back in time because these rocks are in a way timeless. You almost feel like this happened yesterday. It, it, it really, you get that feeling sometimes, particularly when you're here early in the morning and there's nobody around. In a valley where the past and the present collide so perfectly, it's easy to lose track of the hours trying to decipher the hidden messages of the Anasazi. Yeah, but if I spend any more time with you, I'm not gonna get anything done ever again. I'm just gonna be out here just looking at rocks. You've been great, I really well, do appreciate it. Thank you very it. much, my pleasure. There's so much to see and do in the Valley of Fire. Make sure you take time out to check out the petroglyphs. Lake Tahoe, a fisherman's paradise. It attracts anglers from around the world, and many get here before sunrise. One of the most beautiful lakes in the world at one of the most beautiful times of the day. Why come out here so early? Because the fish are jumping, man. Nice seeing you, Captain hey, John. Good meeting you, good seeing you. Thanks for having us out here. You bet. Well, it is definitely the most beautiful place I've ever been. It's, it's spectacular. I mean, words defy it. How long have you been coming out here? 27 years. Luck is on my side. I'm out on the lake with one of Tahoe's most experienced fishermen, John Shearer. So what kind of fish you got here in the lake? Lake trout, which is a mackinac, they call them out here, planted from Lake Michigan area. We have rainbow trout, brown trout, and kokanee salmon. Then you have the mountain whitefish, which is the only native species left in Lake Tahoe. So how many boats do you have? We have eight charter boats, all the way up to this big one, 45 feet, down the smallest is uh, 30 feet. It's kind of pretty out here. It's gorgeous. Wintertime's even better. No kidding, why is that? Well, it's so calm and there's no other boats on the lake. Ah. So you're the only one out here. You have the whole lake to yourself. Well, those fish are calling, I can feel it. Let's get it done. Yeah, I think they are. This is the first of three trips Captain John makes every day. And there's one early rising fisherman whose line is already in the water. Just keep reeling. Just like that, and watch your tip. Okay. The tip of the pole tells you everything. <laughs> All right, let, let's way, just keep reeling, way. though, big boy. Keep reeling. <laughs> yeah, there. It's in the boat. There it is. Wow. Look at that. Woohoo. Wow. We're going to name him Dinner. We were promised about 90 fish today, and I'm like, yeah, 90 fish, right? Well, we got 89 more to go, but we're off to a really good start. The area around Lake Tahoe was once inhabited by the Native American Washoe tribe. Tahoe derives from the Washoe word meaning the lake. So, Captain John, what kind of bait do we use when we come out here? We use uh, minnows, the silver side minnows, the red side minnows. You can only use uh, the minnows that come out of Lake Tahoe. You can't introduce another species of minnow. But you're also using corn. We're using corn, uh, nothing but the best. What's your best fishing story? What's a Really, the best fishing stories are taking the families, yeah. taking the kiddos that had never caught a fish before. That yeah. really is always the best one, you know. And you know what else I like about Lake Tahoe? The people here, are, are they're great. It, yeah, very easy going people. Easy going people. We call it Tahoe time. Tahoe time. I'm casting my line into the largest alpine lake in North America. Hopefully I'll catch a giant fish. Keep reeling. All right. Keep tension on It's already popped out, so just Smooth, slow. When he pulls, you go slow. When he doesn't pull, you go faster. That's, it hit it actually when it was coming up. So we're gonna bring the weight all the way up. Just keep in tension, slow Ooh. and easy. That's a good one. That's a big fish Ooh, here. That's some work. Oh, we got him snagged. Oh. <laughs> hey, whatever works, Hey, right? whatever works. Whatever works. So there you go, keep him in the water. All right. Ooh, that's a big fish. Wow, welcome to Lake Tahoe. Hey, buddy. Look at I've been looking for you. He's, he's going the wrong direction, isn't he? There you go. There we go. It's in the boat, baby. <laughs> All right. All right. What do we got here? Oh, that is we beautiful. We got a lake trout. 
Oh, look at that. Look at that lake trout. Let's take a look. And what we do is we grab them right by the gills. Remember, lake trout have teeth. So you don't want to stick your finger in the in the mouth there. Put your left hand like that and then grab it like this, and that's a good picture, just like that. All right. All right. Put these here. Yep. There we go. And you hold it out way out in front of you, and then it's twice as big. Then it's twice as big. There you go. What a beautiful thing. I've been looking for you all morning. I've been looking for you. Sport fishing isn't easy. You really have to work for your catch. Earn your dinner. Earn your dinner. Hold, hold, hold steady for a second. Yeah, that is a fish. There's another fish. There you go. Got him? There we got go. him. Got another one. Wow. Got another one. They're coming in. It's raining fish. Look at the beautiful green color on this fish. And when you reel them in, you can see them from 80, 90 feet down heading towards the boat. We rose with the sun, and our hard work paid off. Lake Tahoe offers great fishing, the perfect climate, and some of the cleanest water I've ever seen. Well, we've had a pretty good day out here. I mean, nobody got hurt, everybody's still friends. And we got dinner to boot. <laughs> we got dinner to boot. You know what I've learned? I've learned that there's no place like Lake Tahoe when the sun comes up, except if you're out there on the lake and you're fishing with good people. Man, what a great time, Captain John. I can't thank you enough. Great day. I'm yeah. coming back, okay? Sounds like a winner. We'll see you next time. Spending a day on Lake Tahoe doing anything, especially sport fishing, is one of the best experiences you could ever have in outdoor Nevada. We're back at the ranch with the Dutch Diva, and today we're experiencing a family tradition in the form of sourdough. We're gonna do something that is actually very historic in your family, right? Tell me about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're gonna be working with sourdough starter. The sourdough start that we use has been passed down in Randy's family, in the Bell family, for over 140 years. So when you talk about the start, you're talking about the actual stuff that it's made from. Yeah, from the original yeast that started this whole process. 140 years yeah, ago. Yeah, it's been kept active. So it's built up, it's poured off, it's transferred to somebody else, but that basic, start has still been kept active through the family. That sounds like a really great tradition. It is, and interestingly enough, it's passed down through the men in the family, and I'm one of the first women that's been allowed really to mess with the sourdough. A start is the primary ingredient in sourdough. The process dates back to early Egypt when fermented dough was used to leaven bread. So this is our crock, and with sourdough, you want to keep it in some kind of a ceramic or glass container, and then you can put that in the refrigerator, and it can sit, we might leave it sit for a month or so. Oh, for four months, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So um, you don't have to necessarily work it all the time. So what is the feed, feeding and caring of this thing? So the night before, I'll take this out of the refrigerator, and I'll pour it into a bowl, and then I'll about double it. So I'll put water and four parts of flour to one part sugar. And then I mix that up and I leave it on the countertop overnight. And then in the morning when I'm getting ready to make something, I'll pour off my start right into here. I'll put that back in the refrigerator and with the remaining, which I have in this bowl, that's what we'll make pancakes or waffles. What a great tradition. What, because yeah. it's a physical thing that people can hold. Oh yeah. And said so this goes back 140 years in your family. It's Nevada history. It's Nevada yeah, it's history. It's Nevada history in a crock. <laughs> Before the widespread usage of baking soda, early American pioneers carried starts and used the fermented yeast to bake breads. Today, extra aged starts are highly prized. So he's adding some eggs, obviously, to get it kind of nice and fluffy. And I think you already added some soda? No, nope, not yet. I'm not yet. I'm gonna grab some right here. So some baking so soda? That amount of that amount of start. See, he cooks just like I do. Just. Just, just dump some in. Yeah, not like you, that. You don't measure, do you? No. So as mm -hmm. I start whipping this, you'll see it'll start growing because I'm putting some air into it. You kind of see it, and it's going to start uh, kind of coming up on me a little bit. Randy adds two eggs and a teaspoon of baking soda to four cups of a sourdough starter. Since there's no added flour, these cakes are super light. Miners used it in Alaska. It was very popular because it's a great source of protein. It's easy to huh. take with you. They would keep it in their sleeping bags to keep it warm because that is one of the enemies of sourdough is freezing temperatures. What happens now? We've so got we're going to take yeah. it from here and we're going to heat up our griddle and, and we're going to make some pancakes and some waffles. Just yep. like they would have out on the range Absolutely. or right Absolutely, outside yeah. the mine. Yeah, Absolutely. best things ever. 
cast iron waffle maker. Can't beat yep. it. All right. Best waffles. Let's do it. Now we have to get a fire going. Randy's using a griddle to make the pancakes, and for the waffles, we're going old school with this waffle maker. Just like regular pancakes, once they start bubbling, they're ready to flip, and Terry's grandkids can't wait any longer. And there you go, that is... The famous a, Bell Sourdough. The famous Bell Sourdough. That goes, that's exactly what it would have looked like 140 years ago. Would have tasted just as good back then. That is what you call a family tradition Nevada style. Mmm, yummy. Did you do good? Mmm, not so yummy, huh? Good food, good setting, good people. This is the kind of tradition I can get behind. I thought that they were gonna be heavier, like buckwheat, but they're not at all. They're light, they're fluffy, they're a little bit sweet. Probably one of the best things I've tasted in a long, long time. They're great.